Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. So despite the snow, we all made it here. Isn't that great? So this morning, in keeping with our tradition of going over the first four chapters of the Science of Mind book by Dr. Ernest Holmes in the first four Sundays of the year, I am today going to be talking about chapter three, which is called What It Does. So to recap, the first chapter was called The Thing Itself, and it was really talking about the nature of spirit and the nature of God, and so spirit being the thing itself. And so the second chapter then was The Way It Works, and it was all about how spirit can only do for us what it can do through us, and that really what it can do through us hinges on our uh, ability to believe. How much can we believe was the question that was asked. So today, I'm going to start off with a quote from Ernest Holmes from Chapter 3, uh, what it does. Here and now, we are surrounded by, immersed in an infinite good. How much of this infinite good is ours? All of it. And how much of it may we have to use? As much of it as we can embody. So my talk today, to, uh, title today is, what it does, what's in it for me. And, which is a little bit different than just saying what it does, what's in it for me. What it does, what's in it for me. <laughs> so anyhow, that quote pretty much sums it up. I'm going to read that quote again. Here and now we are surrounded by, immersed in an infinite good. How much of this good is ours? All of it. And how much of it may we have to use? as much of it as we can embody. Now I was toying with the idea of just saying, okay, that's it, my talk's done. If you've got that, <laughs> I'm good to go, have a nice day. But Steph will never get me, let me get away with such a short talk, so I'm gonna continue. So <laughs> that, that quote was from the very end of the chapter. And so at, in that point, Ernest Holmes is just sort of summing up all what he's talked about through that entire very rich chapter of the Science of Mind. So I'm going to go back a little bit and find out a little bit more about how he comes to that conclusion. So um, just as a reminder, last week I talked a little bit about the idea that spirit can only do for us what it can do through us. And that we are always an active participant in the creation of our lives and our experience. We always have to uh, believe in what we can receive. And so spirit can only do for us what we can believe in. So the question that came through this chapter is why? Why does spirit want to do anything for us? Why does spirit need to create through us? Well, what Ernest Holmes writes is in expressing itself through us, it becomes more fully conscious of its own being. Therefore, it wishes to express through us. It wants to. And we have heard the same uh, theme echoed in other writers. In fact, Sophia uh, did a re reading from a few weeks back from the Conversations with God by Neil Donald Walsh. And, and he says something similar, that spirit or God or infinite source has created this living universe by means, as a means of expression, expressing itself, of knowing itself better. So as we expand our consciousness, we really are helping spirit to expand its consciousness of itself. That is a grand and magnificent purpose. The Centers for Spiritual Living, the greater organization that is an international organization, has in, for its purpose awakening humanity to its spiritual magnificence, which I love. And what could be more spiritually magnificent than to be totally conscious of our role in unfolding that infinite consciousness of spirit to the fullness of its own being. We are here to help spirit express itself more fully. And life is spirit's experiment in consciousness. And we get to actively participate in that experiment. That's a wonderful thing, I think. So, as I've talked about a number of times before, I'm sure you've figured out that I, uh, 
I check things out on Facebook quite often. And one of the things that I found on Facebook just recently was uh, a little snippet of a video by Neil deGrasse Tyson, or of Neil deGrasse Tyson. Now, Neil deGrasse Tyson is an a astrophysicist, cosmologist, author, and generally an awesome science -y guy. And he does a lot of public speaking, and he does a lot of, of uh, uh, events and things like that. And this particular event, whatever it was, I don't even know, uh, they took a tiny snippet of what he talked about because there was this little girl, this six-year-old girl, that wanted to ask him a question. And so this little six-year-old girl went up to Neil deGrasse Tyson and said, how can a first grader help the world? Well, Neil deGrasse Tyson first uh, sat down on the auditorium floor in front of her so he could be eye-to-eye -eye with her. And he said to her, you know, do you like banging on pots and pans? And she said, yeah. He says, do your parents let you do that? She said, no. <laughs> and he said, well, you know, it's because parents, they don't like it if the pots get dirty and it makes a lot of noise. But I want you to tell them the next time you feel like banging on pots and pans, you tell them that Neil deGrasse Tyson said it's okay. Because when you're banging on pots and pans and you're trying out this spoon on this pot, and what does that sound like, and that spoon on this lid, and what does it sound like? Really, you're having fun and you're doing an experiment. You're doing an experiment. You're being curious. And then he says to her, so what about mud puddles? When you see a mud puddle, what do you want to do? And she says, jump in it. <laughs> and he says, yeah, of course. He says, do your parents let you do that? says, no. <laughs> he said, well, the next time you see a mud puddle, you tell your parents that Neil deGrasse Tyson <laughs> said that it's okay. Because when you are jumping around and splashing around in that mud puddle, you're being curious about what will happen. You're experimenting. You're having fun, and you're experimenting. And this is what children are so wonderful at. This is what kids are great at, at having fun experimenting. So that's what you need to do as a first grader, to help the world. So, this got me thinking. Because really, life is an experiment. We're all on this uh, earth plane, in this, in this physical form, to experiment. And if we allow ourselves to be joyful and curious and have fun with it, we can have fun with the idea of just finding out, well, if I do this, is it better than if I do that? Or what happens if I do this? What's the better choice, this or that? Well, if I try things, I will find out what the better choices are. I don't have to be so serious about my life. I can be joyfully experimenting with life all, all the time. And really, when we are experimenting with our lives, what we're doing is we are expressing that part of spirit that wants to express through us. We are expressing that joy of spirit as it is playing with life through us. And how awesome is that? So when we're developing that joyful curiosity of life, we are in fact working with that curiosity of spirit within us. This is why Ernest Holmes calls the science of mind science. It's about uh, a scientific curiosity of what spirit does, of what the mind of spirit does, what the mind of spirit does through us. And he wanted to have that scientific curiosity about spirit himself, and so that's what he wrote about, and that's what he taught about, to teach other people to have that scientific curiosity about their own lives and how to improve their lives. And of course, I believe that one of the most important tools that Dr. Ernest Holmes taught us in the Science of Mind book is about spiritual mind treatment or affirmative prayer. And what he taught us is about a method, really, a process whereby we can recognize that spirit is within us and then we can affirm our good and bring and attract more good into our lives. So, one of the things that I just love about this particular teaching. You know, there are many different New Thought teachings, and all of them teach basically the same thing, that as you change your thinking, you change your life. 
right? That's what most New Thought, from Unity or A Course in Miracles or any of those other New Thought teachings are all about changing your thoughts so that you can improve your life. And hopefully they're also all teaching that when you improve your life, you improve the world. Because that's where we really want to go, right? We don't just want to change ourselves, we want to change the whole world. But the thing that we have here at the Centers for Spiritual Living is that we teach the science of mind, and the science of mind teaches spiritual mind treatment, which is affirmative prayer, which is our method, which is a, a spiritual tool that helps us to get there. And so this is a beautiful thing that we have here that I absolutely love. Now what uh, Ernest Holmes talks about in this particular chapter, this is the first chapter of the book where he starts to talk about spiritual mind treatment. And he says, treatment is active, it's not passive. It's not passive like meditation, where meditation you are just simply uh, opening yourself to be at one with that divine. And that's a very important spiritual tool, and of course we do that here, we just did that this morning. Um, however, when you do treatment, you take it one step further, because you take that oneness with the divine and in that space of oneness, you actively affirm your good. You actively declare your good. You claim your good. And that is how you begin to see changes in your life. And so what Ernest Holmes says, he, he gives an example of iron. And he said that, uh, you know, in an iron foundry, what they do is they, they melt down the raw iron and they put it into molds. And he said, if we did not place it in proper molds, the liquid would assume no particular form. And so what he's talking about is our lives. If we don't place our intention into a particular form, into a particular mold, it won't make a particular form. Now, I don't know a lot about how iron is created, but what I do know about is jello. <laughs> and I was thinking to myself, so if I, if I mixed up some jello and I just poured it out without any kind of form or bowl or anything, what would I get? I'd probably get a, a, mess. a well, sticky yeah. pancake of rubbery, you know, possibly tasty goodness, but really <laughs> it wouldn't be all that appetizing, it would be hard to serve, you wouldn't want that, right? So, because jello doesn't mold itself, you have to put it into a mold. And so just like the spiritual substance with which we create our lives, with which we create our experience, you have to place it into a mold in order for it to uh, become the thing that you want it to be in your life. So this is what we do with spiritual mind treatment. We provide the mold for our lives by being definite in our intentions and in our choices. And we bring then definite good into our lives, definite good that we can recognize. And that's part of the experiment, isn't it? That's part of the experiment that you can see. If I do this, then I receive these results. That's how the scientific part of it works. That's where Dr. Holmes wanted us to go. So Dr. Holmes wrote, the first principle is goodness. And only insofar as our thought and action tend towards a constructive program will it eventually succeed. So what he's really talking about there is that, yes, there's all this goodness in the universe, but if we don't put ourselves in a constructive program of creating that good for ourselves, then we're really creating our life by default. You know, we're, we're going by the law of averages. So you might get a little good here, and a little not so good there, and you know, you're taking the good with the bad, and you're, you're looking at your life um, as happening to you rather than something that you're creating for yourself. This infinite good is ours. When we set about to constructively create it for ourselves. And the wonderful news is that spiritual mind treatment, or affirmative prayer, is super easy to learn. It's very simple, and it's simple to do for ourselves. That's one of these spiritual tools that we teach with the Centers for Spiritual Living, and that's one of the tools that we're going to be teaching in classes, which start this next week, which I am so excited to be uh, able to do. 
So we have this tool in hand in order that we can expand our consciousness of the good, of that infinite good that's out there, so that we can change our lives. And again, by changing our lives, we change the world. We change everything. So, if this is so simple, I ask myself sometimes, why do unwanted situations still happen? Even to those of us who are trained in the art and science of spiritual mind treatment or affirmative prayer. Well, Dr. Holmes tells us that trained thought is more powerful than untrained. And the one who gives conscious power to his thought should be more careful what he thinks than one who does not. You know, if you're living your life by default, it's always going to be by default. But if you are consciously training your, your, uh, your mind and your thoughts to, to be that powerful, they're going to be powerful all the time. So while I train my consciousness to powerfully attract good into my life, if I allow my mind to slide back into those old patterns of fear and anger and frustration, negativity and doubt, well, the power of my belief, the power of my thoughts, doesn't just turn itself on for the good stuff. It's, if it's on, it's on. So just as the power of my belief can attract infinite good, the power of my belief can also set up roadblocks, or trials, or tests, or suffering. And it couldn't be any other way. It couldn't be, because if it, ha if it works, it has to work all the time. It has to, because it's a spiritual law. So if it works in one instance, it always works. So this past week, as some of you already know, I was knocked off my feet for a few days by an infection. In the midst of this experience, of course, I went to my go-to response, which is spiritual mind treatment. And as I was doing my, my mental work, my spiritual work for myself, I promptly dismissed anything that I had said in my treatment because I had this persistent thought that it's really very hard for me to do treatment for myself. It's very hard for me to do prayer for myself because I am so immersed in this, uh, uh, in the middle of this stuff that's going on with me that I, I can't possibly see a higher spiritual truth for myself. So do you hear that belief? I can't possibly. So of course my spiritual mind treatment did not, uh, wasn't so effective. So I asked my my lovely wife and co-minister, Steph, if she could do treatment for me, which she, she uh, lovingly did. I also thought about emailing my prayer partner, but I didn't. And generally, instead of actually receiving that goodness, I allowed myself to wallow for about a day. And the effect of that was that everything, of course, got worse. Because I was so into my doubt and negativity and fear that this would get worse that I didn't allow it to get better. So then I went to the doctor to get some antibiotics because clearly this infection was not going to go away without some medical help. Do you hear that belief system? So then when I was at the doctor, she said something that uh, sent my mind in a whole other direction altogether. She said, if I didn't see significant improvement within a day or two, I would have to go to the hospital to get IV antibiotics because she was giving me the strongest stuff she had. Well, you can imagine in that cycle of fear and doubt and negativity that my mind really played on that. I had this whole scenario set up in my head where I was going to write the talk and then give it to Steph and she could just read it because I was going to be in the hospital with IVs and tubes hooked up to me in all directions and I was going to be laid flat for weeks on end. Um, so, of course, a day and a half later, I wasn't seeing the significant improvement. In fact, to me, it looked even worse. And how could it do anything else? Because that is what my consciousness was putting out there. But thankfully, I woke up. And I began to do my uh, work in consciousness. I began to do that uh, cleaning up of my own consciousness at that point. Now, I've been listening to Louise Hay. I don't know if all of you know Louise Hay, but she is, uh, she actually learned 
her uh, ideas of affirmations, which she does, that's her, her big thing, is to do affirmations for healing. And she learned that through the science of mind. She studied the science of mind for a lot of years. So I decided to mindfully do some affirmations. And as I was doing them, I was still, you know, hanging on to a little bit of that negativity, so I was telling myself that I don't even know if I believe in these affirmations. <laughs> and so that wasn't, you know, uh, really affecting me too deeply. And then I was deciding that I, I needed to prepare for this talk anyhow, because regardless, I have to make sure that Steph has a talk to give, if nothing else. And so I began reading this wonderful and rich chapter of the science of mind, and out pops this. If a man is seeking to demonstrate, he must tell himself that he has faith in his power in his ability, in the principle, and in the certainty of the demonstration for which he works. Faith, being a mental attitude, is according to law. And even though one doubts, he can overcome his doubt and create the desired faith, definitely. Definitely, meaning that you do your treatment about faith. You do your affirmative prayer about faith, if that's where you feel you are lacking. And that is exactly what I needed to read at that moment in time, of course, because life is perfect. Life always gives to me exactly what I need in the moment. So I stopped everything and I did some prayer work firstly around my own belief, knowing, as I said last week, that I already have within me all the belief I will ever need. I simply have to pay attention to where I'm placing that belief. And so then once I had found myself in a more common centered place, I began doing my treatment for health, for wholeness and vitality and energy and life to be unveiling within me, to be unfolding within me. And you see, wholeness and vitality and life, that's all I'm made of. That and absolutely nothing else. I am life. That's what I am. And the life of spirit lived through me. It still surprises and delights me every time I see the demonstration. It's ridiculously giddiness in, in, inside of me. So within maybe an hour or two hours at tops, I started to notice a difference. And the infection started to recede and I started to feel more energy and I was so excited I would like run to the mirror every now and again and just see how far it had gone back. And I began to feel that life coming back to me, that life that is me started to sort of raise itself up. And the one other beautiful thing about that is that of course now I get to stand here this morning and give you a real life example of what it does. And what is in it for me is everything. Everything that I desire, everything that I choose, every intention I set is in it for me. Ernest Holmes writes, we look too far away for reality. We have made a riddle out of simplicity. Therefore, we've not read the sermons written in, in stones, nor interpreted the light of love running through life to return to a sane simplicity is one of the first and most important things to do. Now, I can't say that this spiritual path, that this spiritual philosophy has always been easy for me, but I will tell you that it has always, always, always demonstrated its simplicity to me. And it is my deepest desire today to impart that truth to you. We are surrounded by and immersed in an infinite good. How much of this infinite good is yours? What's in it for you? Everything. You are loved.